pleased to have Dr. Sajadi with us for this webinar series, Focus on Research, which puts the spotlight on new research on gender and sexuality. And Dr. Sajadi's research is exciting in many ways, as it provides not only a very rich ethnography of clinical approaches to gender variant children in the US, but it also asks critical questions um, and pertinent questions about the concepts of gender that circulate in such clinical practices, but also in our contemporary culture and indeed in our existing theories of gender. So in a sense, this is research that is interpolating um, many of us about the concepts of gender that we rely on and perhaps take for granted. It is critical research and critical thinking that keeps us sharp, which is something of great value in and of itself, but even more so, I would add, in the midst of a strong pushback against gender or the gender ideology movements as they are sometimes called and a return to essentialized biological understandings of gender think of one of the uh, slogans that the uh, the protesters in france in the gender ideology uh, demonstration uh, uh, used which was we want sex not gender um, also in the midst of vocal turf, trans exclusionary radical feminist revendications, and also in the midst of certain forms of essentialized or essentializing identity politics in which a critical approach to existing understandings of gender is sometimes foreclosed. And all of this while gender non-confirming lives in general, and especially those of children, of young people are particularly vulnerable lives. So this is a very difficult and a very politicized landscape to navigate. And we have much appreciation for the thoughtful, the careful, and simply the smart ways in which Dr. Sajadi does so. So um, I would just like to mention two recent articles that uh, were published by Dr. Sajadi. First of all, Deep in the Brain, Identity and Authenticity in Pediatric Gender Transition in Cultural Anthropology, and also the Vulnerable Child Protection Act and Transgender Children's Health in uh, the trans, trans Quarterly Studies. And we are eagerly awaiting uh, the book, which will be published, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with the University of California Press. And I think the articles at, are at this moment uh, shared in the chat, so you have a chance uh, to look at them. Dr. Sajadi is currently Assistant Professor of Social Studies of Medicine at McGill University. She's a medical doctor, received her medical degree from Tehran University, and she's an anthropologist, received her PhD in medical anthropology from uh, Columbia University. She has held research fellowships at the Graduate Center, CUNY, at the Paris Institute for Advanced Study, and at Princeton University. Dr. Sajadi's research lies at the intersection of the anthropology of medicine, gender and sexuality studies and childhood studies. Her previous research focused on the AIDS epidemic in Iran and her new project is Transnational Ethnography of Contemporary Sexuality. We are also very pleased that Professor Hirche Mak is with us and will be engaging with and will be in conversation with uh, uh, Dr. Sajadi's work. Professor Mack uh, holds the chair in political history of gender here at the University of Amsterdam and has written many books and articles on the long and complex histories of gender, of which I will just mention one book today, Doubting Sex, Inscriptions, Bodies and Self in 19th Century Hermaphrodite Case Histories, published by Manchester University Press. And I think the link is also appearing in the chat. We will proceed in the following way. Dr. Sajadi will first talk and offer some key insights from her research in about 25 minutes. And then Professor Mack will offer a response and be in conversation. And this will be, um, this will follow. So that conversation will be followed by the possibility of um, Q&A from uh, the audience. Um, so I will open the floor uh, at some moment. There's a Q&A button, um, if all is well, on your screen. And this is where you type your question and I will uh, read out the question. And then we will wrap up um, around uh, 5 p.m. Amsterdam time. 
so that is pretty uh, that is that is that is all from me today or pretty much most from me today and it is with great pleasure that i give the floor to dr sajadi thank you very much for this invitation and uh, this generous introduction and just to be in conversation with you and uh, professor hirschmack who has actually influenced my work uh, deeply and that's such a pleasure to be here. I also want to read the thesis of your students. They sounded just fantastic. Uh, so um, it's interesting. And this, I also wanted to ask, is this the last seminar, webinar of the year for your center? For, for this year, yes, yes. And that's why it's the, more, the festive one where we have the prize. And uh, yeah, it is. But seriously, anything that puts an end to anything this year is festive. So let's just bring it to an end. Yeah, I'm glad to be the last one. Um, and uh, on that note, it's, uh, really, it's really important to acknowledge how harsh it has been for so many people for various reasons. Uh, one of the groups of people who has been particularly um, affected uh, by the pandemic have been people who have had any kind of uh, ongoing medical needs and medical uh, care, uh, which has been profoundly um, affected by these conditions we're having now. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that given that my also talk will deal with, um, with med questions of medical care. Um, it's also interesting these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of presentations on Zoom now, in, in a way, everyone from anywhere can join who has access to the internet, just sort of quite make it quite interesting and democratic in a way. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a subject where you really have to pay attention to the local politics around it, it creates quite <laughs> uh, some challenges that I'm not sure I can fully um, uh, sort of uh, engage with uh, all the range of global uh, politics in different locations around the issue. But uh, just so I want to emphasize that most of my research has happened in the United States. Um, the practices, uh, these practices in the United States also have close ties to, to Western Europe and what has happened historically, but also, um, well, in the contemporary era. Uh, Netherlands in particular. So I, I hope some aspects of it would be uh, would be sort of useful to think through in other contexts too. Um, yeah, I, before I um, before I start uh, this the talk, I wanted to uh, men say a couple of words about terminology. So there are a variety of terms now with sort of overlapping and shifting meanings in use to describe uh, children. Uh, including children who I will be talking about, uh, uh, including gender non-conforming, transgender, gender dysphoric, gender expansive, gender creative. Uh, I will use the, gen the term gender variant throughout this talk as an umbrella term for children whose behaviors and interests and ident or identifications diverge from the cultural expectations of the gender assigned to them at birth. Um, of course, all these terms I mentioned are terms coined by adults. Um, I do want to, I will, and I'm going to keep using a, an adult word, but I want to mention that ch children do sometimes come up with their own terms. Uh, sort of during my field work, um, sort of at one of the first affirmative clinics in the US, uh, for example, a five year old had told their mother that they were girlish and um, the mother guessed guess that this was a term used in a derogatory manner by some other children, but the child had found it revelatory and sort of adopted it. And another, a nine-year-old after a mathematics class told their parents, I'm dimensional, and that was the term that uh, they, they picked for themselves. So, uh, but of course, they don't break through the professional and clinical language in that way. Um, so now that we're talking about terms and terminology, I should also say something about the word and the category of the, ch the child, right? This would be a sort of a lecture in itself, so I, I can't go very deeply into that, but just very briefly, um, I, um, I generally will refer to young children, um, like uh, roughly, let's say, under 12 or so, 
and try to specify adolescents when I talk about them. Generally, in, in a lot of contexts, people use the legal category of the child, so sort of in many contexts, and about under 18. Um, but I think I, when we are concerned with medicine in particular, the legal category is not always very helpful. And I think a 16-year-old and like a five-year-old are, um, are very different. Uh, and um, it is sort of absolutely true that the cultural understanding of who a child is, in which the legal plays a part too, uh, sort of is important in making and creating childhood. And even more so, the socioeconomic conditions of childhood. For example, let's say people tend to believe that at certain ages they can ascribe uh, particular skills and capacities to children. But there are six year olds um, who live in sort of middle class, uh, upper middle class, northern, let's say, uh, very protected environment where they cannot even cross the street alone. And then there are six year olds who work on streets and they can navigate and know a, like a major metropolitan city by like, um, like the palm of their hand. Um, they use public transport. They, so just wanted to say that given the conditions of the life of children, even their capacities largely vary in the same age. Yet, um, there is something to be taken into account about physical difference and the bodily difference of children with adults. Uh, for example, if you are, I don't know if you've ever worked in a pediatric emergency room, you would know that if you um, give the same dose of drugs uh, <laughs> that you give to an adult, to a, uh, to a four-year-old, it could be deadly. Um, so there is, uh, there is very clear sort of bodily differences that need to be taken account when we think about medicine and, and, and children. Um, I think there is um, there's growing sort of an emerging literature on uh, transgender children in various contexts. For example, the, I think the last academic event I physically participated uh, was an event in New York on um, um, on uh, tra trans of color uh, scholarship where Dora Silva Santana presented on, uh, on her research on black transgender childhood in Brazil. Uh, so sort of this re research accounts for difference and inequality across race, class, and place among transgender youths. Um, and I, I, I believe most of what is exciting about gender happens outside of the clinics. So I just want to acknowledge that, but my research is about the clinical field and sort of now I've moved to some of the developments within the clinical field uh, in the uh, sort of in the sort of how I now describe it as early 21st century. Um, so um, one of the main questions that is currently framing public and clinical debates around gender variant children is whether they will persevere in their cross-gender interests and identifications. Um, if they do so, then it is considered appropriate to sort of allow them to transition, right? Uh, sort of cr critiques of early childhood gender transition maintain that the majority of gender dysphoric children or, or gender non-conforming children do not grow up to be transgender, um, therefore, these practices are not uh, uh, to be uh, allowed. And advocates of, for gender transition among children uh, often maintain that that's not true, uh, and they counter other evidence as, that shows that uh, they, they will remain transgender into adulthood, and therefore their gender transition is warranted. So in this talk, I, I want to give an account of how we got here in the first place, and whether this is the right question to ask. That is whether the child's future, future gender and sexuality is predictable and that should guide, the, whether that should guide clinical interventions. Um, and I want to ultimately make the case for allowing children to explore gender and in some cases transition across gender categories without ref, uh, requiring a long, a lifelong commitment to a particular trajectory. So this preoccupation with uh, future gender sexuality of the gender variant children sort of has been around for a long time and has shaped the clinical practices that developed in the, um, primarily in the like 1960s in the US as sociologist Carl Bryant has shown. 
The earliest rationale for treating feminine boys, which were the primary recipients of these treatments, was to prevent adult homosexuality, transvestism, and transsexuality. And those treatment protocols within the, the approach that is now has come to be described as corrective approach attempted to eliminate feminine interests and behaviors of these children, such as playing with girls and their toys, wearing girls' clothes, and exhibiting girly body gestures. Um, Oz was often assumed to be a domineering uh, mother, a controlling and domineering mother that doesn't allow the separation of, uh, of the, the boy. Again, most of these conversations were around uh, feminine boys at the time. Uh, and therefore, some goal of treatment in addition to those behavioral interventions was to sort of reset the family balance in a sort of a more patriarchal family structure. Um, and these, uh, so there are a few characters in this story that are, uh, I will mention them because they're, they're important. This clinic, particularly in Los Angeles, which was led by uh, Robert Stoller and Richard Green, um, which was sort of where they mostly systematized the clinical treatment of uh, gender variant children. It was also the clinic that uh, was tied to sort of uh, emergence of the concept of gender identity, which was proposed by Robert Stoller in 1964. And it was uh, sort of as a psychological sense of maleness or femaleness and was an intervention into uh, sexologist John Money's uh, in, you, uh, term gender, which in fact in the 1950s emerged and as a sexological term. And both of these people were involved in um, trying to explain their inter the condition of their intersex and trans patients. And later they ger generalized this concept beyond, beyond those, uh, those groups. So, so basically treat these treatment practices around gender variant children like, emerge in tandem with these, these concepts that are so profoundly right now shaping uh, not only the clinical field, but also public understanding of uh, sort of uh, gender and transgender in ways that, of course, there have been other uses of this term by feminists, by transgender thinkers and intellectual and trans feminist thinkers uh, that are not the same as sexological concept, which usually thinks of it as a trait of an individual, like it's something you have, you know, you have a gender identity. Um, so this is important. Another importance of this area and the era and this clinic was that this is where the these practices and the concept of gender ident identity led to emergence of the psychiatric category of gender identity disorder in children, which for the first time entered the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1980. Um, and uh, sort of the DSM was a very uh, influential psychiatric manual. Uh, I studied it as a medical um, sort of student and intern in Iran, and that's some, actually how my research began and my interest in this topic. I wanted to understand at the time when I was doing my research, uh, uh, most of my field work, which was around uh, 2010 to 12, with follow-ups in 2014 and 16, um, the American Psychiatric Association was revising its manual for its uh, fifth edition, and I wanted to see, uh, I have always been sort of perplexed with some of these criteria of like um, choice of toys and clothes as sort of a scientific criteria for, for mental illness category, and I wanted to understand uh, how this manual is being, uh, being revised. Um, so that's a whole other story, but the category was very contested, but it did remain in the DSM and change name to gender dysphoria. Um, um, uh, so I just um, wanted to show you this book by Miss Richard Green. Okay, cool. So this is a book that was very important and Richard Green wrote the uh, sort of <laughs> the sissy boy syndrome. Uh, the result of um, uh, his, uh, his sort of research and clinical work with these kids. And as you see, it's called the, uh, the Sissy Boy Syndrome and the Development of Homosexuality. So this is the period where, for the most part, um, the gender variance in children is associated with a future uh, gay outcome. What is interesting um, is that 
even though initially uh, the pre homo preventing homosexuality was one of the goals of treatment by sort of um, declassification of it from the DSM and sort of changes of political and cultural changes uh, around that uh, sort of uh, Richard Green dropped that from the goals of treatment. And in fact, at some point claimed that his treatment, the same treatment paradigm led to sort of ho homosexuality rather than, for example, a transsexual outcome that he perceived a less desirable one. And this is important, I think, um, to keep in mind for sort of when we think about all these debates about sort of whether these children are gonna be gay, lesbian, transgender, and sort of some of the fights that are happening over, over uh, sort of over these uh, issues. Uh, so, and this is like um, sort of the first version of the DSM-3 DSM that, um, the third, that uh, where the gender identity disorder in childhood appeared. In fact, the term gender identity disorder was first used for children in the DSM rather than adults. Um, and later it was also became a term used for, for adults. But uh, so I'll read a brief uh, sort of um, quote from an interview about the experience of families who underwent these therapies, these corrective um, therapies. Uh, th so this is a quote from Catherine Twerk. He was four when he re returned to the US from Germany. It was the early 70s. He was in nursery school for one week when the teacher called me and said, Mrs. Stewart, your son is playing in a dress up room and not with the trucks and balls. This was like, oh God, now somebody else is noticing. So this must be a problem. My husband was a psychiatrist in psychoanalytical training. We sought excellent psychiatric advice at the time. There was this horrible feeling that I had done something wrong, but I didn't know what. Was I too seductive? Was I too punitive? Was I too this, too that? They suggested we put him into contact sport, so he started playing soccer. He was a good athlete, but he did not like rough play. It scared him. We tried to discourage him from playing with girls. We did everything we could to get him to play with the boys. He was not allowed to dress up. We did it very nicely, but he knew that it was not acceptable. So he essentially did nothing. He would just sit around and do nothing. He wasn't allowed to do anything that he liked. Even, even when drawing, we would say, don't you want to draw a truck? It was that intrusive. At age eight, he was not improving. They suggested that they put him in psychoanalysis. So from eight to 12, my son went uh, four days a week to psychoanalysis. I call what we did physician assistant uh, child abuse. So just, um, and so this actually, this parent uh, decided that no, no other child should go through this uh, later and became very active and one of the uh, uh, important sort of uh, forces behind what became known as the affirmative approach to, to gender variant children. So in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the affirmative approach emerged out of dissatisfaction with the previous corrective approach to gender nonconforming children on the part of progressive clinicians and parents of children who had been subjected to the corrective treatments. And within a few years, it marginalized those, that older um, corrective paradigm that had held sway for decades. And so this approach posits that ch children gender variance, um, the term that is used by proponents of the affirmative approach is not a mental disorder and distress is not inherent to it. It is a natural variation in the child's developmental trajectory and should be allowed to flourish without disparaging any potential adult outcome and pressuring the child toward conformity. Uh, so these early affirmative clinicians, which had generally also a medically non-interventionist approach, believe that children didn't need therapy for gender variance, but they might need therapy for its consequences such as anxiety caused by harassment and bullying. And that it's often parents who need supportive psychotherapy to cope with their child's condition. Most affirmative clinicians and advocates lean toward innate biological explanations for children's gender variance, like a natural tendency that should be valued and fostered by adults. Um, often the, the affirmative clinicians have stayed away from psychoanalytical theories given the sort of what I described and the history they have had in pathologizing um, gender nonconforming and um, non-heterosexual individuals, but they also were alternative psychoanalytical theories that developed in this period. For example, Ken Corbett, uh, a psychoanalyst uh, in New York, um, uh, came up with a different uh, psychoanalytic theory. And he has also argued that we should pay attention not only to pain and shame of the 
gender variant child, but also resistance and the mental freedom that enables the child's gender variance. Um, so when I was doing the field work in the clinics, parents were very interested to know what the future of their child will, would be in terms of gender and sexuality. And um, affirmative clinicians, what in this period, which are called the early affirmative clinicians, had different approaches to this question. For example, one parent explained to me that uh, she had, one parent who had taken her four-year-old child first to Dr. L and then to Dr. M, uh, told me after a 45 minute session, Dr. L told us, Lucas is going to be a gay man and he will be a masculine gay man. We were totally surprised. Um, he also said uh, that the dress up will stop, but it didn't. When we went to Dr. M, he told us, I can't tell you what Lucas will be. The most significant benefit for us was to have someone say, we know what you're talking about and this does happen to other people. You don't have to figure everything out and it is his path and to allow us to sit back and let Lucas lead us. So this period uh, sort of is also a period um, er, that the meaning and association of childhood gender variance in relation to adult outcome within the clinical field began shifting with increasing visibility of adult transgender individuals and also um, non children who started uh, transitioning. Um, and so at this period, also, and I think this is all related to a growing understanding of gender and sexual orientation as distinct phenomena. Uh, and I think this is very important in sort of, again, um, thinking about this current debates and sort of uh, conflicts in the sense that um, uh, there is this effort to understand whether these children are truly, what are they gonna be? Are they truly transgender? Might they be, end up gay since we have some knowledge that uh, so many gay people had um, gender non-conforming childhoods. So this, uh, and what, uh, what I think is sort of important to acknowledge is that um, these categories and relation to each others has been shifting. And, um, and in fact, if the work of, for example, David Valentine, in term, but in relation more to adults, has explained sort of the relation of category of gay and transgender and the process through which uh, they have increasingly come apart in the last few decades, and also how um, some um, sort of political and strategic uh, moves also from sort of the mainstream of sort of gay, um, uh, gay um, advocacy has uh, endorsed and embraced this sort of um, uh, allowing gender nonconformity, visible gender nonconformity, a public public gender nonconformity to the category of transgender, while arguing that sexuality is something private, uh, and therefore uh, sort of reducing the stigma that the visible gender nonconformity brings for, for certain kind of uh, gay and lesbian um, individuals. So I think um, uh, this now, this sort of the, now is also unfolding around the question of gel, gen, uh, children and sort of increasingly um, the sort of gender nonconformity is of course associated with, uh, with, uh, with being transgender uh, also, it is the case that uh, gender, gender is more easily imagined as a matter of childhood than sexuality is, right? So, so I think all of these are important in issues that are um, happening uh, currently. Um, so um, I just wanted to quickly move to, so this was some of these uh, developments that very in a few years you have a lot of media attention to uh, two transgender children, and um, so, sort of during these years of my study, two two sort of discourses very strongly began to rise in the clinical field in trying to give an account of the condition of transgender children. One was a whole uh, narrative around the true gender self, and um, and the idea that sort of gen transgender children are different from other gender nonconforming children in that they really truly have a gender identity at that diverges from, um, from, from their anatomy. Uh, and this is different from other gender nonconforming children who are only their behaviors 
uh, sort of diverge, not the deep sense of uh, true authentic identity, right? This was one line. And there was another um, narrative that emerged this, this period, and that was about um, very much focus on risk and dangers that uh, sort of a visible transgender body could uh, could uh, could ensue for people. Therefore, if we can find children who would end up being transgender and prevents those uh, bodily changes that will cause a lot of suffering and discrimination and stigma, is going to be beneficial to to children. And sort of, um, I just want to. Um, read like a quote from one of the pioneers of the uh, some of the medical interventions um, in the US. Um, this is the quote, I try uh, to prevent genotypic females from developing breasts that will have to be removed. Um, so there was uh, this, what increasingly what I have called and used sort of the term anticipatory temporality, uh, uh, which uh, sort of medical sociologists and anthropologists have, uh, have come up with, so, which has a policy of both temporality and affect. And the, uh, this um, sense of sort of dangers that, is, that was attributed to an adult uh, visible trans life and to sort of soon to puberty as the cause of that uh, became really within a few years very dominant uh, within the field and um, puberty was perceived as uh, sort of as, um, as as a danger to the child. Um, and it's interesting that in this period, in fact, social transition of young children was more contested than medical interventions such as puberty suppression. In fact, that was developed in the Netherlands. And um, at the time in the Netherlands, also it was not accompanied by social transition. It, that hap would happen later in life. In fact, the term transgender child emerged a few later in the mid 2000s in the US. Um, so, um, I want to say a word about um, this uh, risk and particularly risk of suicide and violence that has been very much present as a specter that has informed sort of medical interventions um, of children. Uh, sort of one of the main achievements of treatment, medical treatment according to clinicians is that a convincing gender appearance would allow their patients to live a life free of social stigma, right, and harassment and violence. Um, one of the, again, one, for example, one of the clinicians who was very uh, influential in developing these treatments um, explained to me that um, we could prevent suffering of adult trans people, which he had uh, worked with previously before treating children, uh, and thought could be prevented if they received treatment earlier in, in life. He was particularly deeply moved by the suicide of one of his first adult patients who had introduced him to the transgender community. Um, so um, I can go much further into this question of suicide and the particular way that it has framed um, this debate, but it's not just new in relation to transgender youth. In the 1990s, uh, the same was mobil mobilized and sometimes successfully for gaining certain services and rights uh, for gay youth. And it also has a longer history in the history of sexology that actually I, I hope we get to in the discussion with Geert um, uh, um, During this period, we also have a very uh, media visibility and conversation around trans women of color. And uh, in the clinical field, uh, it was a lot of times with very good intentions, these image of sort of the suffering and the violence that uh, trans women of color um, underwent was sort of used to mobilize almost as, as something to prevent, um, right, uh, for children. So in their critique of the political uses of violence against trans women of color by mainstream LGBT organizations, Riley Snorton and Jean Hartshorn discuss how some transgender people who are poor, racialized immigrants engage in sex work only come to matter after their deaths, when their suffering is transformed into source for visibility, claim to victimhood and legal protection for another more respectable cohort of gay and transgender people. I think with regards to children, that was a temporal gap to this sort of biopolitics of which trans futures are deemed livable and which ones are to be prevented. 
um, and sort of some of the more often middle class children, in particular with younger children who were seen in the clinics, sort of preventing that kind of future um, was some, also a, an important motivation. So just all of this to say, we see the perseverance, even within the affirmative approach, a perseverance of a preventive logic that I, I, I said that corrective approach had. But at this moment, the treatment goal is no more, it's no more legitimate to prevent a gay or transsexual outcome, but what is still considered legitimate is to prevent children from developing into adults with incongruently sex gender bodies, to prevent the immense suffering that would uh, befall them otherwise. Um, so, um, I also want to say a few more words about the true gender self which was in fact uh, very much popularized by the work of psychologist Diane Ehrensap, who says that once we are born, the true gender self is most definitely shaped and channeled through our experiences in life, but its center always remains our own personal pos uh, possession driven from within rather than without. And so um, th throughout uh, the, throughout the, um, I have written extensively about the sort of notion of self that is invoked in this in this debate, and sort of as as deeply as interior bounded um, uh, and sort of uh, authenticity that is attributed to interiority and innateness in this debate, um, and uh, also how culturally compelling they have been, and sort of tried as an anthropologist to understand uh, why that is that they sort of resonate so so deeply, and I think. Um, um, this both the idea of interiority and innateness have been quite important in what is considered an authentic origin of the self. Um, I, if we get more chance in the q and I say more about it, but I also want to say that this sort of, uh, at the same time, a sort of notion of gender identity of the brain developed these years and sort of um, the idea was that some children are born with the brain that is uh, already been gendered differently than their, anat their sexual anatomy. And then this tension between their identity and the sexual anatomy leads to sort of this distress that needs to be sort of prevented and helped by uh, tools of medicine. So this, if you look at this diagram, this, this image is quite sort of popular and shows uh, some current paradigm we are, um, we are seeing with, uh, with gender, which is, um, sort of gender is in the sort of brain, uh, not in the, in the genitals. So the, within the clinical field, the, our, the current sort of paradigm on gender and sex is sort of as a dual essentialism, right? It's just that we have the sex and then, but we have a thing that is different, which is uh, sort of gender identity, right? And they, in most people, they somehow uh, align and in some a small minority of people, they don't align. Uh, and, and therefore we sort of need to um, change uh, the body to align with the gender. Of course, there are very different um, accounts of transgender embodiment. This is, uh, one of the, <laughs> this is one of the sort of simplest ones that is dominant within the clinical, um, clinical fields. Um, but, and so, sort of within this narrative, sort of gender identity is a thing inside person, which is prior to sexual external forces. Um, and um, as I said, the, the, even though the concept of gender identity developed in mid-20th century, we have an older history of that, of actually what Hirtgemak has called sex of the self, that is sort of now is what I argue is being allocated to the, to the brain. Um, and uh, it, sort of, it somehow, in fact, the clinicians had even used the word soul as a replacement uh, for brain in some of their, their narratives. It seems to be that um, sort of this, we need to look at some soul body dualist theories that have emerged in the history of sort of ancient and modern philosophical, religious and medical thought with their different accounts of interaction between the soul and the body to sort of understand some of uh, these cultural co concepts. Uh, of course, you know, that's, Christianity in particular has emphasized on the idea of substance dualism, that is ontological discussion, distinction between the body and the soul. 
and um, sort of and human being as fundamentally a soul that initiates action through the body in the manifest world. Um, sort of this dual, dual, I think the dualism we see in some contemporary clinical conceptual, conceptualization is similar premise on distinction between the body and the brain. Uh, and interestingly, this association of the self with the brain has not idealized, in fact, I argue has dematerialized the brain as something different from the body. And so I think within this debate around sort of return to materiality in social theory, we should avoid a careless equation of nature, materiality, and science. The return to science and sort of entities such as gene for sexual orientation or brain explain transgender identity uh, is not always a materialist turn. And the sort of this phantasmatic deployment of the brain in conceiving identity shows how I think it's an extremely idealist way of thinking. Um, so, um, I don't, so there's a whole other, uh, how much time do I have? I think you're out of time. <laughs> okay. I think so, you, if you want to wrap up, yeah. To wrap. yeah. So, uh, so sort of uh, born this way is of course a very um, um, sort of dominant narrative now within sort of, in the US at least, within sort of the gay transgender, um, uh, mainstream gay and transgender uh, movements and um, also, I have tried to explain why is it, and under conditions of inequality and stigmatization, how sort of these innate biological explanations um, ground minority condition in ontological difference and endow the self with authenticity, legitimacy, and stability, and sort of um, how um, born this way basically recuperates sex gender deviation on the side of the natural plus good to claim to its innateness. And sort of this uh, legally also the discourse has responded to the religious rights rhetor rhetoric of choice in the US that was employed to deny equal rights to LGBT individuals. Um, so and children have sort of have a long place in uh, the sort of philosophical and sort of cultural thought in uh, being sort of a harbinger of authenticity and sort of finding the uh, truth of the self in the child in childhood has been uh, sort of, I have many sort of now um, examples of explaining how that has been th thought through. I don't have the time to go through that, but I just uh, sort of want to emphasize how children imagine as the past of adults and careers of seeds of adult identities and not only um, uh, the temporal politics surrounding adults' relation to children is not just that of orientation toward the future. Uh, that I previously mentioned the anticipatory temporality, but also sort of queer theories such as the Edelman have emphasized on sort of this orientation toward future in relation to child, but I'm saying that there's also this look, this is sort of imagining them as the past, right? And there is in this ba backward and forward looking that somehow uh, we have a, some closed loop that can have a hard time imagining other ways of being um, that may not be as accessible to us or available available to us adults. Um, so, and also um, many post-colonial theorists have, have pointed to how this way of imagining uh, children is important to understand uh, colonialism. So in fact, that the ch children, the relation of liberalism to children um, and sort of imagining also other people as, uh, as sort of, um, as, as the, the, in the past are, are tied to each other. And sort of uh, fa anthropologist Fabian uh, also has shown us that how in his work, uh, Time and Other, how inequalities and power relations that produce uh, seeing the other as non-contemporaneous non to oneself sort of function. Okay, so to conclude, um, and, get, and I want to get back to the, um, so this was the question of authenticity that I said it comes from inside, it has always been there, so this interiority and innateness. But I just want to conclude now uh, and um, that by a few words about what I think um, this sort of how to answer this clinical question. Children are new to exploring and understanding gender, how it shapes their position in the world, how this position varies in different environments and cultures and subcultures they move through, 
and how it relates to their body. Their knowledge of the world is growing exponentially and their body grows and develops with a velocity different from adults. Their gender interests, conformity or non-conformity might change. Not all gender conforming children will grow up to be heterosexual cisgender adults and not all gender non-conforming children will belong to gender and sexual minorities in the future, while many might. Moreover, the categories of sexual and gender variance are in flux and how we understand the relation between gay and transgender these days was different 20 years ago and maybe different 20 years from now. Within the same category, transgender lives are diverse and not as uniform as often portrayed in the clinical debates. Affirmative care could draw a more expansive picture of transgender lives and experiences that are not always reflected in medical setting or mainstream media. New identity categories emerge as well. As an example, in recent years, increasing numbers of young adults are identifying as non-binary. And we do not know what possibilities for gender variant life await children and what categories will be available to them and created by them in the future. So accepting the unpredictability of the child's future identity would invite clinicians to revisit medical interventions that are primarily geared toward preventing or achieving certain adult gender or sexual outcome. But unlike what the critiques of childhood gender transition claim, I think allowing gender, young children to explore gender and those who strongly desire to live as the other gender to change their name, pronouns, and clothes is not incompatible with leaving the door open for various trajectories that could emerge later. And uh, we don't need to make a lifelong commitment uh, the condition for such exploration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sahar. That's um, <laughs> very rich. There's so much in there. Thank you. Um, Hircha, I'm immediately going to give the floor to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you uh, so much, Sahar. This was a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. Um, and I knew your work on the true gender self very well, but this place is in a much larger context and it's really um uh, wonderful how you do that how you help us to understand a history of like 30 years maybe maybe a little longer where you actually show how we have come to um conundrum sort of how, how the western world has or I, I should say maybe you're very precise in saying that you're talking about a clinical situation i think that's really important because of course the transgender world is much wider than just a clinical situation so that's that's really uh, helpful, I think. Um, so what you actually explained to us is how we have come in a situation where we at the one hand have come to acknowledge um, gender variance in children and, have to and, and, and acknowledge that we uh, want to affirm that, that we don't want to, you know, correct that. Um, but that in doing that and in our, you know, adult fears for these futures of these children that we also want to prevent any harm in the future, we're very protective of them, we don't want them to, you know, while they explore their possibilities uh, that they, uh, they uh, get wounded or whatever, that they get hurt, so we have sort of developed this idea that we can control that. That's what, you're t that's what you're telling. And you're saying that in, in, to control that, we have to figure out one important thing, that is, if this is a consistent thing, is this child uh, you know, if, um, showing signs of, of a consistent gender variance that we can be sure that if we do anything with their hormones, which is not innocent, by the way, yeah, so that the, the, the hormone blockers are not innocent medicine for just a postponement, that you can talk better about it than I can, but um, let's say that. So shall we do that? Shall we take the decision uh, and then prevent possible f future harm that we know from transgenders who sh still show physical signs of their uh, change? Or, um, uh, is our diagnosis not sure enough? Can we be sure about it? How can we be sure about it? And your work is, is very uh, clearly showing that in order to, to make that decision, we need this concept of a true gender self. And this concept of the true gender self must be placed already in the child. And um, then only we can decide that we make this major um, decision in the, in the, in the, for and with the child about their future 
um, physical outlook, I should say, a physical body. So you're actually putting the question quite sharp. How, how have you come here? Um, you, 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 uh, I, I love how you also help us to understand why we came there. It's not like all these clinicians are bad persons. They have, they, they show care, they show a concern. So it's not just, you know, bad, but at the same time, you're very critical. And, um, I know your work uh, on, on this true gender self, and you're also very sharply pointing to the fact that actually, even if there's no evidence at all, we have not been able to, to find any place in the brain where gender should be located or found or whatever. Nobody has found that at all. Still in the clinic, you find these stories in which it's easily said that this narrative is there, the true, the true gender self is located in the brain, point. So you you say it's a belief. It's a, it's a, it's a, almost a narrative of a religious narrative, and you also point out to this dualism that you call an essentialist dualism. It's very interesting, um, and I think you may be in a position also, as you have some distance from a Western self-evident um, way of thinking about selves, to see how that works. So. I would very much invite you first to, to say a little bit more about what you see in this kind of almost religious self that is located by clin clinical people who consider themselves to be scientific people um, in the brain. And I wanted to connect that to your remark about the, um, the importance of the stressing of suffering. Everything is about suffering. It's not about exploration, desire, creativity, um, trying out, um, uh, trial and error. It's all about deep um, um, existential suffering. And this is a very, um, as in the story, I, I, can, I can tell that it's a deeply, deeply ingrained in, in the history of sexuality, in the history of gay, lesbian and, and transvestite and transsexual emancipation. It's always there. Uh, I think, um, now I forgot the name. Uh, I will come back to that. But th that's a long story. Right. So, but is that related to, do you think it's related also to the Christian uh, suffering narrative or, uh, yeah, so tell me more about this part of your work. <laughs> I was hoping to have a scholar of religion here. I was hoping to get some help <laughs> on Christianity. I'm yeah. not the most club. Uh, so I, it seems to me that, I mean, the religion, I, and I feel like this sort of um, account of also born this way have something to do with sort of some um, doctrines of predestination as, you know, and, um, and, and the emphasis on suffering. Um, yes, it's very dominant. I just want to say something that, of course, the clinical field is also not totally homogenous. Uh, there are people who have take a different, and I said, for example, even the term gender creative has been used by some, uh, but the, the, this, these are the sort of some of the really, um, I would say at least in, in the period I was doing my field work, this became sort of dominant um, ways that was framing, uh, certainly in the clinic, I, I, one of the clinics I did my field work. Um, and and also sort of more the media accounts that are sometimes also very sensational around these questions of sort of violence, suicide. Um, a, yes, so I um, I would I would think that there is some relation between uh, this notion of um, suffering and but more. Okay, so I think there are some probably older cultural substrate there that sort of allows this kind of narratives to gain hold. But also, I think we should also see what is happening um, in our contemporary moment in, in the United States, particularly, where therapeutic culture is ex, um, really, really expanding to every sort of aspect of life, every aspect of politics. Um, and this account of sort of suffering and healing, uh, sort of which 
gain psychological therapeutic dimension, but also have very deeply sort of, I think, Christian values. And, and, the, and a recent critique of these ways of thinking about politics, I think is emerging in very different sites. I actually last week was um, at an amazing talk, well on Zoom uh, by um, an indigenous scholar, this, again, this is a very different context, uh, who was arguing against, uh, and uh, had a critical perspective on the sort of ubiquity of the notion of like historical trauma and how it is uh, sort of, uh, it really, really proliferating and sort of the, the, what does it mean to sort of then have generations of people who think of themselves as primarily as sort of uh, uh, injured, damaged, victimized uh, in ways that uh, may not be the most uh, sort of um, helpful way for, for, for minorities and marginalized and oppressed groups to understand their condition, right? So, I, so that's, of course, in a very different context than the context of gender and sexuality. But I just think there is also something more contemporary in sort of expansion of therapeutic, certain kind of therapeutic culture that very much focuses on um, sort of on injury in that, in that way that perhaps should be taken into account. I don't know if that is, is sufficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then, I just, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. I guess so that's also the scholar that I mentioned. I just want to mention his name is Dr. Guan. Um, yeah, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I, another point that you raised, I just wanted to um, emphasize that sort of within also, again, the clinical field, gender transition has become understood as equal to medical transition, which of course in the adult trans world, that's not the case. And sort of people have very different relations to to medical treatments in different times in their life. Some people use certain intervention, not the others. Some people don't use, but sort of within sort of the, at least those, those years that these treatments were developing in the clinic, it was just really one form. Like it was like one kind of transition in mm -hmm. I wondered actually whether there is also such a thing as a, a true, um, um, say non-binary, identity. Yeah, that's really, <laughs> okay. so when, for example, uh, one of those pioneers of these treatments in the US was very adamant when I interviewed him, that was like, that's, um, there's no such, like people haven't yet made up their mind or something. But mm -hmm. I think that's, so already so much has changed in the last few mm -hmm. years and that's mm -hmm. kind of really exciting and interesting. And, the, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and so I think, um, Th that is yet to be fully, I think, incorporated within the mm -hmm. sort of very binary paradigm that I described, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think, um, yeah, again, as you said, uh, the clinicians are deeply caring about the patients. And I mean, I just really, that was also my understanding. And it has been, I think, in the history of the field too. It's just that, well, the conceptual tools maybe need um, a, sort of a mm -hmm. revision, but also, um, like even uh, it's just important to remember that even someone like Richard Green, who is now, by the way, he died um, last year. But I saw him in 2016 in Amsterdam in the uh, in the World Professional Association of Transgender Health Conference. He still was defending. He was saying, "Okay, you cannot really prevent." He was not anymore believing that you can prevent a particular psychosexual outcome, but he still thought that his treatment helped children. And not be ostracized and bullied by sort of control, sort of a little modifying their gender behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so even, for example, Richard Green at some point was himself advocating for gay rights, for de declassifying homosexuality, but he still thought it was legitimate to prevent it in children, given how hard lives of gay people is. And sort of admit to him, it was like, well, of course, if you can spare someone that kind of, you know, discrimination and hardship, why not as a clinician? So I think this logic kind of in some capacity con continues and I think we should really mm -hmm. think about that um, in our care and also paradigms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would also like to bring in some of the questions that are being um, asked at the moment. So there's the first question by Rezvan Mokalam. Um, 
First of all, I want to thank Dr. Satya D for her very good presentation. I would like to know her opinion on sex reassignment surgery that some doctors and psychologists recommend, given that gender is in the brain, not in the penis or vagina. Okay, I think there has been a misunderstanding of what, so I, so sort of this idea of gender being in the brain is not my opinion. And in fact, if you want to read a good book about it, it's a, a book by Rebecca Jordan Young, explains um, sort of the theory, uh, explains this whole theory that is used uh, for, for these claims. Uh, so I don't think, um, I don't think that human brain is gendered in that way, like a male or female brain that you can be born with one or, or the other. Um, so, I, so just that's my response. <laughs> yeah. And um, I will afterwards maybe put the book in the chat that people can also check out the book. She um, was one of, uh, we, we had a lunch seminar with her a couple of months oh, ago. And we could you. still actually have physical seminars. Um, but I'm moving on to the next question by E. van den Busse. What do you think of the recently increasing testimonies of detransitioners? What does this phenomenon imply on a clinical level? I am notably thinking of the legal case won by the female detransitioner Kara Bell in the UK uh, this year. Okay, that's uh, a, <laughs> so in fact, sort of how I ended my talk was sort of trying to allow the possibility that people change in their lives. And sort of, I prefer to use the term retransition, which would uh, suggest uh, that you sort of you have another transition and it's and I think that you never go back in time right it's like and uh, and gender also changes with age so I think that's a very something to take in I don't think a like a 50 year old woman has the same necessary gender as a 20 year old or or, or herself 30 years ago or like a five-year-old girl so um, so I, I think these are all important to consider I think there should be a way to understand and supports people who want to change their gender uh, again without having that being used as um, sort of against uh, the possibility of gender transition in the first place. And I, um, so I, I sort of how I ended, I was like, so if we accept the unpredictability of the child's future identity, we, sh we should be careful not to gear our clinical interventions towards sort of preventing or achieving an adult um, outcome, right? Um, so that, that I sort of um, think that's something to think about at the same time as whether you're an adult, whatever age you are, you might change your mind and regret certain decisions. And I think that should be part of the conversation rather than something that absolutely, ha if, if it happens, so, sort of everything should, should fall apart or, yeah. So. Yeah. Great. And so now there's a question coming back to the question of suffering and Christianity, where you both um, had uh, lots to say about. So this is a question from Carol Vance regarding oh. <laughs> and its relationship to Christianity. Roughly speaking, in Christianity, suffering is part of the human life to be endured, even expected due to sin in the Garden of Eden. Although believers cry out to God for help. Jesus also suffered to redeem humans. So suffering seems very embedded, although it has a kind of dignity and respect. By contrast, medicine and psychiatry aims to relieve or even eliminate suffering. Suffering that can be relieved is a failure and the person suffering is damaged. So what do you think about this? That was amazing. <laughs> I'm just, um, yeah, I, I think that, well, um, I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe suffering as a too general of a concept to, yeah, maybe certain forms of suffering and maybe, um, maybe um, it is something about in the case that I'm discussing about, about children and sort of uh, the particular ways that suffering of children is very disturbing to people and the, the desire to save, to intervene um, in, the, in that suffering, sort of a sort of the interventionism that in, is within um, sort of what, what I have 
described is also related to this idea of sort of the suffering child who, who needs to be saved. But it is, yes, I think probably both any gen such generalization about suffering or about Christianity <laughs> uh, might just not be, but like that was, an, that was a sort of a great, um, I think, way to put these two in relation to each other and i'm thinking about it at this moment yeah, yeah I, I would like to to add something to that because if you read the many many uh life stories of people who suffer so from from early gay lesbian trans and and, and they're already very early until now it it often has to do with um a suffering that sort of purifies their own idea of self and that sort of um so it says, even if the whole world doesn't want me, I am myself. So there is something about um, through the suffering, you become clear about who you really are. And uh, so because even if you have to suffer for it, you do it. So I, I, I totally agree with Carol that, um, yes, uh, medicine tries to then help you with it. But there is something before that in the story that people tell about themselves that sort that sort of makes up that um, that self, and there is that's where I thought the relation was between the idea of a self as a soul, something like that, that comes into being through that suffering. And I think that there's a relation to Christianity, but then of course there's this almost counterintuitive idea of completely erasing that suffering um that is not fitting with that so there's more to think i think so thank you carol so far for this remark and i have a question Richard. do you think there is a class and race dimension to these kinds of narratives of for example the in the earlier sexological um texts on sort of um, yeah absolutely know. yeah absolutely when you looked at um lower class sinners so uh, who, pe people who went to prostitutes or abused they were not seen as suffering from their own conscience. They were, you know, seen as just bad. <laughs> so there was no room in the stories for for the telling of a of this, this sort of questioning of your own conscience and your own, you know, being in a world that was not um, that was contrary to the world, but at the same time also could be exempted because you suffered so much. I do think it's important when you look at these genealogies to um you know to to notice the christian genealogies i think there's christian genealogies to a lot of this right i also noted down in my notes you used the word soul and you suggested that doctors in the clinics use the word soul that is something uh you know to to really uh, unpack right so these genealogies are i think definitely there and very important but i also think they get repackaged and, and notions get repackaged and rearticulated. And I think what, what, what Carol Vance here is pointing to with the suffering is, is indeed one of those instances. And then I think every time it's, you know, one needs to think carefully through, you know, yeah. what is the genealogy here or the genealogies in the plural, like a religious one, but maybe another one as well. And how does it get repackaged? And then, yeah, what is the, the, the race, class, uh, gender distinctions uh, of all of that? But I still want to get, I'm looking at the time and I still want to get those, um, the, the questions that are being asked here. One by Simona Schneider. Thanks so much for the fascinating talk. What are your experiences of doing ethnographic research in a clinic context? What methodological challenges did you face and how did you overcome them? Well, I mean, the most, I mean, it was an extreme challenge to be there in the first place. Uh, because of sort of uh, really very, very uh, complex um, sort of ethics uh, approvals that you need for being in clinics in general, especially dealing with children on a you know, topic that is sensitive. Uh, so in one of the clinics I did my field work, um, which was more, more of a child psychiatry affirmative clinic, I had uh, access to see that like full sessions uh, with, uh, with sort of families and children. Uh, and in the other cl clinic, I, my access was only to sort of sit in the uh, discussions of the clinicians of the cases after they saw saw the patients, right? So it was a I had a different sort of uh, access. I think um, the ch the challenge uh, throughout uh, was, of course, also to explain the nature of my work, which I wasn't I was not studying the children 
uh, sort of for clinicians that was so I was studying the clinicians for the most part and they were the subject of my my, um, my study and like clinical practice right um, but also later I think the challenge of writing about this material so much of the ethic um, sort of so much of the debates around ethics um, in anthropology are around sort of imagine the power relation to be sort of a sort of a euro-american um, sort of of course, the scholar researcher going to a community that is uh, disadvantaged, right? And sort of that, the debates are within that power relation. So it was a very different constellation when I, who am from Iran, particularly, you know, how think about gender and sexuality and how people assume the assumption they have about that part of the world doing uh, sort of research on this subject. Um, and in sort of these clinics, of course, my medical background was what even allowed, made that possible in the uh, sort of first place, I'm sort of, of course, that complicates the situation of uh, sort of my role and, uh, and there, but but I just I want to say that I, there's a lot of questions for me still about sort of ethics of our research uh, when I had some elements of sort of either studying up or studying powerful actors, right? And how do we sort of stay um, really faithful, like loyal to sort of uh, the relations you have with them and who have enabled your research in the first place at the same time that you can have some sort of critical perspective and analysis. So I think that's sort of the challenge primarily. So then I'm going to read you the two last questions and um, uh, yeah, that, that will be the end of, uh, or then you can kind of wrap it up with uh, um, your final words and Echirche as well, if you want. One question is from Marco Borkent. I was wondering if Dr. Sajadi could expand on the notion of non-contemporaneousness that was introduced, the children versus adult story. And the second question um, was, uh, is by uh, Yingjie Dai. Thank you, Dr. Sajadi, for this fascinating talk. I think you were mostly talking about the clinical understanding of children's true gender self in a US context. And I am curious if there were similar discussions and debates in other countries, cultures, and milieus. OK, so non-contemporaneous. Uh, so that was sort of I tried to explain the idea that it seems that to a great, to a great part, the whole history of clinical field around gender variant children has been shaped by certain ideas and concerns about what they become in the future as, as adults and sort of how seeking the sort of truth of adult identity and authenticity in childhood has a long history. I mean, uh, you'd even see that like in, I mean, like long history, but also more like 20th century versions of it too, in whether it's Freud or whether it's, it's, it's sort of a very, um, very present, I think, in in certainly American culture. So I think um, that sort of critique of sort of thinking about someone as sort of, as if it's your past. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's always how people encounter children, but I think there's a, there's a strong way of thinking, especially with sort of sexual gender identity, given also the uh, prominence of these narratives of born this way, and which then has to be sort of in, in you know, in childhood, if, if you were born this way, and has to be found in your memories of childhood and, all, and sort of all of that. And sometimes that is, gets projected to actual children. And sort of that, um, that was an uh, idea um, about the, and sort of, I think that uh, I, in that sort of a debate in anthropology and uh, also how, in in a lot of situations, sort of other cultures have been perceived as sort of the past of human civilization or something. And and there's there's a link to sort of discussions about around, for example, Uday Meta in his in his book on liberalism and empire, uh, very much goes into this idea of how 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 the way understands of childhood as are in fact central to understanding in fact the colonial relations. So that's one other subject. So in, in true gender. Well, I, you know, there's a, a large sort of, um, not so much yet about children, but about adults, there's a large literature on sort of different uh, notions of uh, self uh, in relation to gender and sexuality in various cultural contexts. So, uh, for example, um, sort of my work ha particularly has been influenced by the work of Afsan Najmabadi, who has sort of done research uh, in Iran about sort of uh, what she describes a different sort of 
ways of understanding the self that is sort of what she calls is a self in conduct rather than this kinds of self-referential sort of deep self right and so there's a there has been ethnographies in various uh, other countries india uh, sort of japan thailand that that sort of question this model of versus versus uh, uh, surface versus depth that, that that's not how people sort of un uh, understand uh, understand the self so um that's what i have to say on that subject So um, I definitely distinctly have the feeling that we could go on, right? Like there's so much more that is on the table and to think through. And I appreciate everybody's engagement and thinking through. Thank you so much, Sahar, for what you've put on the table, what you've offered us. Thank you so much, Hirche, for engaging with that. And also all of these questions. Thank you so much for the, the audience, which in this weird format we don't even see, but we've heard your words and uh, your great engagements. And um, yeah, so I'm going to close it off for today um, with lots of gratitude and hope to see many of you in one of our next webinars. Thank you very much to our speakers. Mm -hmm.